The greatest of ulama, from the greatest of scholars, the muhaddithun, those people who took it upon themselves, those people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitated that they would be people to preserve the sayings of our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved Al-Quran and that there is no doubt about that. But concerning hadith, more study that is needed, more knowledge that is needed to decipher, for us to authenticate statements and for us to find out whether those statements really go back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or not. You can go to the shelves of many masajid and you find Sahih al-Bukhari or you find Sahih Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it easy for us to refer back to the authentic statements of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now this great muhaddith, Abu al-Husayn, who was born in the year either 204 or 206. He was born in a time where Islam was very powerful and very strong. And that many of the muhaddithun, many hadith scholars that they were on their journeys and preserving and gathering a hadith. He was born approximately 12 years after Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala. Now, just as Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, was not an Arab, nor was Imam Muslim ibn Hajjaj, rahimahullah, he was not an Arab either. He was born in al-Faris, al-Fursi. He was Persian. So, Muslim ibn al-Hajjaj and Nisapuri, like many of the ulama, they were brought up in a household of knowledge that his father, rahimahullah ta'ala, although we don't know a great deal about, was somebody who was involved extensively in hadith. So Imam Muslim rahimahullah in growing up was involved in attending halaqat, in attending circles of knowledge and listening to the scholars. So he took it upon himself and found it within himself wanting to follow in the footsteps of those people whom he had contact with. Now he himself rahimahullah ta'ala, Imam Muslim, was, uh, if you like, a businessman. He didn't just rely out or rely on handouts of people or, for example, beg. But it was the practice from the time of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum to seek provisions, to seek sustenance, and at the same time to seek knowledge. And Imam Muslim rahimahullah ta'ala would at times uh, give halaqat or give, uh, or give classes where trade used to take place. However, this is what he did ta'ala, to ensure that he didn't miss out on any time in, in learning and teaching. Uh, at the beginning of his seeking knowledge, would travel extensively, starting in Nisapur, in Bilad, uh, in Persia, that he traveled to Dimashq, to, to Sham, he traveled to Hijaz, in the uh, western side of the Arabian Peninsula, into Egypt, into Iraq. So he traveled extensively, finding and searching for a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now Imam Muslim rahimahullah ta'ala, bearing in mind that the time that he lived, and looking very carefully at the books that he compiled, now especially we'll be focusing on somewhat to his most famous book, which is his Sahih, which is the compilation of Sahih Muslim. You can see clearly like all of the other scholars that preceded him and those who followed him that his creed his belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was something that was very pure they would have correct opinions concerning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge also concerning the issues of al-qadr now you may ask well, it's a book of ahadith not a book of aqidah however that is the statement of a general person who doesn't understand that there were absolutely thousands, 300,000 or 400,000 ahadith that Imam Muslim ta'ala, may have gone through. And then to come up with about 3,300 3, or 3,000, just over 3,000 ahadith to be placed in his sahih, well, he could have placed so many. 
However, just as Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, when you look carefully at their compilations of their ahadith, it is in fact a reflection of their belief. It is a reflection of their understandings of jurisprudence, of Islamic fiqh. The creed of Imam Muslim, rahimahullah ta'ala, can be understood and taken from the ahadith that were chosen and placed in his sahih. And only a person of knowledge will be able to determine that because they will have a fine understanding as to why these actual ahadith that they were chosen. In the time that he was born and in the area that he was born, in Nisapur, which was away from the Khilafah, which, which was in Al-Baghdad, where there was some fitna concerning those who said that the Qur'an was actually created. Now for two reasons that Imam Muslim rahimahullah ta'ala wasn't directly involved in this. Number one, geographically, that he was quite far away from it. And secondly, that he was particularly young while this fitna was, happen, was happening. And as you uh, may or may not know, that Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala, the great Imam, Imam Sunnah stood up for and clarified that in fact that the Qur'an was not the created speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be that as it may, Imam Muslim rahimahullah ta'ala was very firm and very strict. And in fact, it comes across when looking at his works and his life quite clearly that he had a very strong personality and was very, very principled. So much so that at times if uh, there was an incident between him and another person that there was maybe some problem that he would leave them and stay away from them to the extent that there, he has two teachers. As I, of course, he has many, many teachers, but two famous teachers um, from them, Al-Duhali and also Imam al-Bukhari. Now, Al-Duhali was uh, involved in uh, a debate and that the person who was talking actually rebuked. Uh, Al-Duhali was the teacher of Imam Muslim. Imam Muslim kept quiet. And then uh, the teacher of Imam Muslim he went away and complained to the father of Imam Muslim and said that, you know, he was here, he didn't defend me and so on and so forth. For this reason, the Imam Muslim became quite upset. And whatever he learned from him, he sent all the information back to him, said, I don't know it from you anymore. And even uh, further than that, that he had great respect and great love for one of his greatest teachers, Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala. However, he did not narrate uh, from Imam al-Bukhari in his sahih which may be quite a surprise that here it is, one of his great teachers, however, does not narrate from him and including that in his sahih. And again, that is something we will touch on uh, in a short while. So Imam Muslim, rahimahullah ta'ala, as we mentioned, so he traveled extensively. Why would they travel to these places? You go to one place, is it not enough? These muhaddithun, they had a number of object- objectives in traveling all to all of these places. Number one, was to acquire the hadith, to go there and to hear the hadith from the individual. Then also, the second benefit there is to verify that hadith, that that muhaddith would have a chain of narration that has reached him. So therefore, let me go to so-and-so land and hear it from so-and-so and let him name the hadith. Not only name the hadith, but he would have to name the rijal. He'd have to name the people in the chain to see and verify that what I have heard is in line with actually what is said in that particular place. A third reason is to seek a higher isnad. That means that in any chain of narration, you will have a number of people between him and the Prophet wasallam. You might have four people, you might have three people. However, if you go to a particular city, there may be a chain there where you are able to miss out a narrator. But there is a shorter way, there is a shorter chain back to the Prophet ﷺ. So this would then uh, strengthen that narration. So you going to different cities and meeting different people, you may come across people who have a shorter chain. So your chain is your one, two, three, and four, and then the Prophet ﷺ. However, in so and so city, you can meet somebody else, and you can go from yourself. And then one, two, three, and then the Prophet ﷺ. So there's no need to go through four people. Here there's only three. So that in turn would strengthen authenticity of the hadith. They would try to seek out the shortest possible chain between them 
and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to find the most authentic hadith uh, that they had uh, gathered. A fourth reason is also to investigate the narrators, bearing in mind that there were people who may have invented certain narrations, or there may be of those people who were accused of maybe having a weak memory, or they were accused of some defect in some way. So by going there, you would be able to meet that particular narrator, and that you could ask that narrator about the one that they had narrated from directly. Did you meet them? Did you see them? Where did they study? You get all this information from them. A fifth benefit is reviewing a hadith, reviewing the chains and the hadith with other muhaddithun, with other great ulama of their times. So the fact that Imam Muslim, rahimahullah ta'ala, he met Imam, Imam al-Bukhari. Imam al-Bukhari is one of his teachers. They were able to discuss and talk about narrations and asanid or chains that had, had reached them. So this in, again would authentic, or enforce the, the learning that they had, authenticate that what they had uh, heard. So these are five benefits, if you like, that the scholars, or why that they would travel so extensively. The Mawatta of Imam Malik. When Imam Malik, rahimahullah, when he was compiling his, his book of hadith, or book of narrations, which is not entirely statements of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but also contains statements of the Sahaba and also statements of Tabi'een as well so it is a, a book of many uh, different types of statements and narrations it was said to him there are many many people compiling books of Ahadith are we in any need of you to write another that what is for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala then it will remain there may be many people who are compiling and doing lots of things, but that what is done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will remain. And when you see now, one of the most famous books of a hadith, Imam Malik, the Muwatta of Imam Malik, rahimahullah. So those books that were written more than a thousand years ago are preserved. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected them and allowed them to remain with us. That they have a precedence over all other books and are in the form that they are now because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them in their lives and bearing in mind that Imam Muslim rahimahullah ta'ala lived to how old? maybe 55 years old not you know, relatively not that old however you find that his sahih along with al-Bukhari are the most authentic books after the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when you look at sahih Muslim itself because Imam Muslim, rahimahullah, he wrote a number of books. But the way that he wrote this particular book, it is amazing, it is an amazing work of hadith. In the way that it has been compiled, the way it has been ordered, the way it has been organized. And in fact, not my opinion, but the opinion of the vast majority of the muhaddithun, that the order, the construction of Sahih Muslim is superior to the order and construction of the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah. That how Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala, when he compiled his Sahih, that he would at times mention a particular issue and then only mention part of the Hadith. He wouldn't mention all of it. So he'd mention the part of Hadith that was relevant to that particular issue that he is mentioning. So you might find the beginning or the ending part of the Hadith is not there. However, you may then find the Hadith is somewhere again mentioned for another time in a different way. So you find the hadiths, the narrations may be partially mentioned in a number of different places and there's repetition. But for most, that they find the order of Imam Muslim rahimahullah in the hadith that it is found, it is found here, you won't find it again, and it is mentioned in its entirety. Therefore, you find that the order and going through the hadith of Imam Muslim in the Sahih Muslim is something which is very much easier than going through the Sahih of Imam Al-Bukhari. And I'll give you a practical example of that. There is a book called Al-Lu'lu'u wal marjan This is a book that was compiled by an alim not so long ago. And this particular Al-Lu'lu'u wal marjan are all those narrations that you can find in both Bukhari and Muslim. Or Muttafaqun Ali. 
hadith that you can find in both Bukhari and Muslim is the most authentic hadith that you can find. This particular imam, he compiled all those narrations that you can find in both Bukhari and Muslim and put them in one book. The author who, or the compiler rather, who placed this together, what you find is the title of each chapter is taken from Imam al nawis explanation of Sahih Muslim. So you find the order of the book is very ordered. However, the wording of the ahadith, the wording of the narrations is taken from Al-Bukhari. Okay? So when you look at al lu Marjan, the titles and the order is taken from uh, the order of Sahih Muslim. But the wording of the narrations are taken from Al-Bukhari. So then, you have to find, maybe if you like, an explanation of the wordings of those ahadith were taken from Al-Bukhari. So the point is that when you're looking at the ahadith and you want to go to Bukhari to find it where it is, you may be jumping around just to find where that hadith is. So the order, this is a practical example of how the order of Al-Bukhari is a little more difficult. However, if you go to the, um, uh, the Sahih of Imam Muslim, you will find that the order is very systematic. It's much, much easier to find because they're very similar narrations, very similar wordings. So you could go through Sahih Muslim and pretty much find an explanation for each of those hadith that you would find in the Lu'lu al-Marjan. So that's a practical example of how the order of um, Imam, uh, Imam Muslim's Sahih is preferred by many of the scholars over the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari. As for actually being authentic, which is more sound, then the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari is more sound, is more authentic. And a very, very simple example of that is as follows. There is a great scholar, his name is Imam Zuhri, was a great muhaddith. And many chains of a hadith, they will go through him. If, you, for example, you go to the books of hadith and you see the chain, you say, An Zuhri. Okay, this is a great imam. Now he had tabaqat. He had, let's say, at the ulama, they say five different levels of students. Number one level, tabaqat al-ula, the first level being the very top students. And then you would have the second level, third level, fourth level, and fifth level. Now Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, when going, looking have a sanad, a chain of narrators, and going through Zuhri, and he had a student he would take from, Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, would ensure that he would pretty much as much as he can only take from the very top students of Imam al-Zuhri. Because Imam al-Zuhri would narrate to another student of his. Imam al-Bukhari would ensure that they have to be from the very high level. And sometimes he would take from the second level of students. Okay? Now Imam Muslim, rahimahullah ta'ala, wasn't as strict as that. So he would delve into the second group of students of Imam al-Zuhri more than Imam al-Bukhari. So this is a very sh- a simple example to show the authenticity or the strength of the narrators, if you like, was stronger in al-Bukhari than it was of the Sahih of Imam Muslim. So the authenticity of uh, Imam al-Bukhari is a level higher than that of Imam Muslim, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala. As we mentioned that Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, was one of the teachers, one of the teachers of Imam Muslim. And it is narrated that Imam Muslim, rahimahullah ta'ala, when Imam al-Bukhari came to Nisapur, that he would sit with Imam al-Bukhari just as a student or a sick person would sit in front of a doctor. And that he would kiss the forehead of Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, honoring Imam al-Bukhari. And even said that, I would like to kiss your feet in honoring you. This is the respect that Imam Muslim rahimahullah ta'ala had for his teacher, Imam al-Bukhari. And from this, we can take great benefit. Now, Imam Muslim rahimahullah ta'ala is not an individual who has gone throughout history and no one has praised him. However, people after his time speaking about, speaking about his work, speaking about him as an imam, as a muhaddith, as a hujjah, as a proof, as a great imam of Islam, that they would... Uh, speak about him and praise him. So, uh, Abu Quraysh Muhammad ibn Khalf narrated that one of his teachers said that the Hufad al-Dunya, those who have memorized, those who have protected and preserved, there are four people. 
One of them is Abu Zur'ah al-Rai. Muslim ibn Hajjaj in Nisafur, Abdullah ibn Abdul Rahman al-Razi in Samarqand, and Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari. Also, Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Ayyakub al-Akharm al-Hafid, he said, Nisafur produced three great men, Muhammad ibn Yahya, Muslim ibn Hajjaj, and Ibrahim ibn Abi Talib. Again, Imam Muslim was mentioned from the great Huffaf, from the great teachers of an Islam and Imam al-Zahibi rahimahullah ta'ala and his seer that he praises Imam Muslim uh, rahimahullah ta'ala. So as we mentioned that Imam Muslim had a very close relationship with Imam al-Bukhari and uh, there were students and other scholars around the time would say that I saw Imam Muslim or Muslim al Muhajjaj before Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari and he was asking him questions just as the child would ask a teacher. He would find two great jibal, two great mountains of knowledge. However, one of them recognized the virtue over the other. And this is how that he would be with his teacher, Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala. And Abu Bakr al-Khatib, he said, Rahimahullah, the Imam or a Muslim used to defend the Al-Bukhari to the extent that his relationship with maybe some of his other teachers, that it broke down. Now, as I mentioned, that Imam Muslim, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, was a great Imam, a pious Imam, and that can be shown in the works that you find in his Sahih. And as we mentioned, as also that he compiled a number of of other books, not just his Sahih. So, for example, you find Rubaiyat fil Hadith. He would find, he would compile all those narrations, which there were four narrators between them and the, the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Likewise, you can find Thuluthiyat of Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah. Those narrations where there are just three narrators between Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, and Rasulullah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Also, Imam Muslim, he compiled books like Tabaqat al Ruwa. He would write the levels of narrators. He also wrote a book called Kitab al-Afrad. He, would write, he wrote a very famous book called Kitab Awlad al-Sahaba. A book about the children of the companion, the very young companions uh, around the Messenger uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. However, it is his Sahih which gained uh, most fame and is with us now. Uh, hamd. So Imam Muslim, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala, he died in the, in the month of Rajab in the year 261 in Nisapur at the approximate age of, of 55. It was mentioned to him a narration that he had never heard before and became quite bothered. So he went back to his home, into his own quarters where he had his writings, his library if you like. He said, no one is to disturb me. I need to find this narration. Looking for the hadith and just living on dates. Until that he, rahimahullah ta'ala, he passed away while well, I'm looking for that hadith. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.